excited to introduce our keynote, uh, Dr. Cedra Goldman Meller, who has conducted extensive research on the trends, causes, and consequences of youth suicidal behavior. Uh, Cedra is an assistant professor of public health at the University of California, Merced, where she serves as a director for biostatistics and data support care. Her work is regularly, regularly featured on media outlets, including the Sacramento Bee and NPR. Thank you very much for joining us today, Cedra. Good morning, everyone. And thank you so much uh, to the organizers for having me here today. Um, I have been told that we have almost 900 people registered for today's uh, conference or workshop, um, which you know is a testament to how important this issue is. So um, I'm so grateful for the presence of all of you today. So I'm just going to quickly kind of provide some the, some research context for thinking about youth suicidal behavior and what we know about it in terms of the patterns, trends, the causes of youth suicidal behavior, uh, key definitions to be kind of mindful of um, for um, the, the, the rest of the, your day today, um, and also what happens in the aftermath of youth suicidal behavior. Um, so as Sergio said, um, so I'm a professor of public health at UC Merced, which is my the beautiful background behind me. Um, by training, I'm a psychiatric epidemiologist, and all of my um, work these days focuses on suicidal behavior, including among um, among youths. Um, and I'm a, I'm not a California native, but I did do all my my training, and I'm so happy to be here in California. So just to get sort of everybody on the same page with some key definitions um, so that we can all, so I'm gonna be using this terminology and probably many of the other presenters and workshop um, organizers today are gonna to be using these same terms. Um, so when I say suicide, when, when we say suicide, what we mean is a death caused by injuring oneself with the intent to die. And, and I, that intent part is really um, an, a key aspect of this definition. These are not accidental deaths. The person was, um, was, was trying to die. A suicide attempt um, is defined as when somebody harms themselves, again, with the intent to end their life. Um, but but fortunately, in that case, they do not die as a result of their actions. So this is sometimes um, also termed a non-fatal uh, suicide attempt. Non-suicidal self-injury, by contrast, is um, also is an, um, a deliberate injury to the body. Um, but the distinction here is that it is an injury um, that does not have suicidal intent. So the person is trying to hurt themselves, but, but they are not trying to die. Many of you may be most familiar with this as like cutting behavior, which is a, a frequent thing that happens um, in teenagers. So together, suicide attempt and non-suicidal self-injury are sometimes kind of um, grouped together in this term of deliberate self-harm. And the reason that we that researchers use this term is because um, you know the the where we get data on suicidal behavior is from from death records. Um, from emergency department records and other clinical um, clinical settings, and from survey data, and especially in clinical settings, it can often be difficult to figure out whether the intent of an injury, um, you know, a non-fatal injury, was to die or just the person was trying to hurt themselves. Sometimes the you know the the youth or the person themselves doesn't actually know. So we kind of lump these injuries together as deliberate self harm. Then there is suicidal ideation. Um, so these are either passive thoughts about um, wanting to be dead or active thoughts about um, killing oneself, but it is not accompanied by any sort of action or behavior. And all of these things together, sorry, the slide's a little bit off. So suicide attempt, non-suicidal self-injury and suicidal ideation, this is often referred to as non-fatal suicidal behavior. And I want to sort of call your attention to the, the bottom of the screen here. So researchers and advocates are increasingly staying away from the terms of um, commit suicide, successful suicide, and completed suicide. I don't use those terms either in my daily life or in my research, and I would encourage um, you also to stay away from them. Um, they are considered insensitive and also potentially to perpetuate stigma. So if you are, um, if you're interested in kind of the rationale for that, I've provided a resource um, down below. Okay, 
So just again, get everybody on the same page, you know, what, what are we talking about when we, um, when we talk about the rates of su um, youth suicidal behavior? So these bars, those are, these are, um, this is data from the entire United States. These are um, death rates. Uh, and know that they are death rates in each age group per 100,000 people. So among teenagers, um, the, the rates of suicide death um, are, so among the 15 to 19 year olds, it is for every 100,000 15 to 19 year olds, we see 11.4 deaths, um, right, the per 100,000. The rates among 10 to 14 year olds are lower. What you can sort of immediately notice here is that, you know, there's this big increase in the suicide death rate in these teenage years, but that the, the rates overall are, are much lower than you see in older, you know, in, in adults. Um, nevertheless, because death fortunately in youths is rare overall, suicide represents the second leading cause of death in both 10 to 14 year olds and in 15 um, to 19 year olds. You see kind of the opposite pad, opposite age pattern when you look at emergency department visits for deliberate self-harm. So this is, these are mostly non-fatal, um, you know, visits to the emergency department. This is one of the places we get data on suicidal behavior. Um, and here you can see that 15 to 19 year olds have my, like by far the highest rates of ED visits um, and followed sort of closely by the 10 to 14 year olds. So their, their rates are much lower, um, but still pretty high compared to almost every other um, adult age group. So from survey data, so this is a little bit different, right? So this is um, youths who are reporting on their own engagement in suicidal behavior. What we see, this is the very recent data from 2019, what we see is that almost 19% of high school students report seriously considering attempting suicide. So this is suicidal ideation. More than 15% had actually made a plan um, about how they would attempt suicide almost 9% reported that they had attempted suicide at least one time. Two and a half percent had made an attempt that required medical treatment. So that tells you something that not all suicide attempts result in injuries that are serious enough to require medical um, attention, but about, you know, among this age group, you know, 2.5% um, of students made an attempt that was serious enough to mean that they had to go to the doctor. So like this tells you something that there's this iceberg, you know, we think of in public health, we think about iceberg of um, icebergs of disease, basically, and, and suicide is, is, is no different than that. So suicide deaths make up a teeny tiny fraction. I mean, they are the most devastating outcome, but they make up a tiny fraction of all other forms of suicidal behavior. So if there's more you know, self-harm visits that require medical attention, there's even more self-harm in the community, right? Where you know the, the person hurts themselves, their youth hurts themselves, but doesn't have to go to the doctor. And there is an even bigger um, layer of suicidal ideation um, among youth. And we need to be worried about all of these. By a little bit more into the kind of patterns by demographic factors, you can see that for suicide deaths, um, it, suicide death is much more common among um, male youths, about two to four times more common than among females. Um, but when we look at non-fatal suicidal behavior, so emergency department self-harm visits, this pattern is reversed. So this is a really striking and um, common finding that non-fatal suicidal behavior is much more common among females, but fatal suicide is much more common um, among males. By race and ethnicity, um, we see, so we don't unfortunately have great data on race and ethnicity, so this is a, a big limitation of, of much suicide work uh, research. Um, with suicide deaths, it's a pretty consistent finding that American Indian youths are at much higher risk for suicide than basically any other racial or ethnic group. Um, white youths are, um, are the second highest rates of suicide death, followed by um, Black, um, Asian, Pacific, Islander and Hispanic use, but I, we didn't, I didn't, CDC does not have great data on Hispanic use, which is why I did not show them here. Uh, for ideation and attempts, this is, these racial ethnic patterns are a little bit different. Um, so you can see over on the left, sorry, these graphs, the text is a little bit small, but you can see that um, the, the percentages of white 
Black and Hispanic youth who report seriously um, attempting, who report seriously considering attempting suicide are roughly equal. For self-reported attempted suicide, again, they're like reasonably similar, but we actually see slightly higher um, rates among um, non-Hispanic Black youths. So in terms of recent trends, my guess is that many of you are already well aware of the fact that suicide rates have been going up in recent years. This is actually particularly true among youths, which is a, a great cause for concern um, in the suicide prevention community. So this, this is data from 2002 to 2018. It's, it's all for youth, but it's broken down um, by older versus younger teenagers and by um, gender as well. Um, so you can see that um, males age 15 to 19 have the highest rates you know, in all of these years, but all of the lines are going upwards. Um, and that is not a trend that we want to see. Same thing with um, these non-fatal emergency department visits for self-harm um, here. So here we see, again, the same gender kind of, you know, reversal of the gender patterns where female, older uh, female use have the highest rates, but all of these lines are going in, in the wrong direction. They are all going up. So I would love to be able to stand here and tell you like, this is, you know, this is why these are the reasons that we're seeing these increases. But the sad truth is um, that no one really knows, um, actually. Um, so these increases in, in non-fatal suicidal behavior could be partly due to an increased willingness of youths to disclose their suicidal thoughts, whereas, you know, due to increased mental health literacy, um, better sort of recognition of mental health and a so somewhat decreasing stigma, they may be more willing to kind of, you know, talk about it. So it could be a slight artifact, but in general, like scientists think that most of the increase is real. Um, it's possible that the Great Recession, um, so we did see these rates go up during the Great Recession. So economic downturn is um, you know, widely understood to be um, a determinant of um, suicidal behavior, but it's definitely not the only explanation. Um, so scientists are still working on this. It's maybe something that you all um, are gonna talk about today. So I know this is a Central Valley Conference, so you may be wondering about you know, what, what's going on specifically in the San Joaquin or the Central Valley. Um, so California in general has some slightly lower than average suicide rates compared to other states um, in, in the US. And similar, the Central Valley has sort of average um, suicide rates. So the, the real, the really high risk populations are in the far north of the state. Um, and the major metropolitan areas, San Francisco, LA, they actually have lower than um, average suicide rates. So you can see this in the, in the map on the right. Um, the blue bars on the left, those represent um, self-harm emergency department visit rates. It's slightly old data, so I don't, I don't have updated data from more recently. But so each blue bar represents one county um, in the San Joaquin Valley um, area. The orange horizontal line represents the California state average. So you can see that youth um, ED visit rates are, um, are uh, sort of by counties, like some of them are hovering right around average and some of them are slightly more than average. Okay, so probably many of you have heard about suicide clusters um, and have wondered about them. So I did wanna talk about them a little bit in this talk. Um, suicide clusters are sort of generally um, considered to be situations in which more suicides than expected occur in terms of time, place, or or both potentially. Um, they can also happen with non-fatal suicidal behavior, but fatal suicide clusters um, tend to get more attention for sort of obvious reasons. Clusters are a little bit hard to define and that makes them somewhat controversial. Like, is this a cluster? Is this not a cluster? Well, there's no good consensus on what constitutes a suicide cluster. Um, there, there, and there's sort of two different types that scientists study. One of these is probably the kind that you're thinking about, which is shown in the, the left-hand map on this slide. These are referred to as point clusters, um, and they are usually thought um, to involve at least three suicide deaths occurring close together in time and in space, right? So like it's multiple deaths occurring like in you know, a school or in a community 
close together in, in time as well. But as I know you all know, youths aren't only paying attention to what's going on in their community, right? Like they are very well aware of, you know, other stuff happening in, in their broader region in their state in the country. And with information about suicidal behavior increasingly spreading via the internet and social media, there is some concern that the incidence of um, geographically kind of spread out clusters, what are called mass clusters or temporal clusters, may be increasing um, a bit. But the sort of good news on this front is that a very tiny proportion of youth suicides occur as part of a cluster somewhere between one and 5%. So it's really not the dominant way in which youths are dying by suicide. Um, the suicide clusters do have some kind of key risk factors, uh, including geographic remoteness of the area, economic deprivation of the community, um, indigenous status, right? So there have been um, several well-publicized suicide clusters in um, Alaska Native communities, um, as well as other Native communities. Um, they do occur much more frequently in institutional settings like schools. Um, and one of the things that research has um, fairly conclusively shown is that media stories about in it, a first suicide death that are when the media stories are prominent, when they're explicit, and when they involve glorification of the person who died, that can lead to additional deaths. So there's now um, media reporting guidelines about suicide in part to prevent um, this. But, it, but in sort of most respects, youths who die by suicide as part of a cluster tend to be similar um, to youths who die by suicide, you know, not, not as part of um, a cluster. So the causes of suicidal behavior are so complex. I mean, really, I could spend the rest of the day like talking about um, this, um, but you know, I only have a few minutes, so I'll try and go through this quickly. Um, there is good, solid research um, underscoring that suicide um, and suicidal behavior can be driven by genetic, biological factors, personality factors like aggression and impulsivity, um, negative life events, so social stressors, um, abuse et cetera, happening in the life of the youth. Um, psychological distress, hopelessness is a, is a big um, factor. Um, potentially exposure to, to the suicide or self-harm in, in their social network, um, as well as the availability of lethal and non-lethal um, methods. So uh, you can think about these risk factors as occurring at multiple levels. Um, so it's kind of personal, contextual, biological, et cetera. For sociodemographic and educational factors, um, a gender, so I've talked about gender, how um, male being male is um, a risk factor for suicide death, being female is a risk factor for non-fatal suicidal behavior, um, low socioeconomic status of the teenager, um, LGBTQ sexual orientation and restricted educational achievement. Then, you know, many times we think about, you know, what's going on in the life of this youth. And there are so many, you know, potential things that can be um, really badly going wrong um, in, in their lives. And many of these um, confer excess risk for suicide. Um, so that incurs, uh, includes parental separation or divorce, parental death, adverse childhood experiences such as neglect or actual abuse, um, physical, sexual, emotional abuse, um, parental mental disorder, which has a genetic component, but is also sort of a, an adversity um, that people um, that youth have to deal with, um, a family history of suicidal behavior, family discord, um, and bullying. And one thing to note about bullying is that the research has very conclusively shown that it is not just the kids who are bullied themselves who are at risk of suicide, it is also the bullies themselves um, who are at higher risk. Um, and then just kind of general interpersonal difficulties. For psychiatric and psychological factors, most cases of um, suicidal behavior involve some kind of mental disorder. Um, and for youth that is particularly um, kind of strong, a strong connection with depression, anxiety, and to a certain extent, ADHD or, um, um, right. So drug and alcohol misuse um, can also be a factor. Um, impulsivity and aggression, right? Suicidal behavior is not just about depression, it also involves an element of this impulsivity and aggression. 
um, and low self-esteem and poor social problem solving, um, as well as perfectionism and hopelessness, um, as I feel like you sort of can't escape, kid, that things are never going to get better. For the sort of context um, and environment, um, the um, some key things to think about are high unemployment, right? So when un regional unemployment rates go up, that has trickle down um, effects and can lead to increases in suicidal behavior. Stigmatizing policies, right? So we don't think so much about kind of the role of policy in suicidal behavior, but there is good evidence to suggest that some policies really do matter. There's um, some nice research showing that the implementation of permissive same-sex marriage policies, right? So like the permission um, for same-sex couples, for example, to get married, um, that reduces youth suicide attempts. Um, so this is something that increasingly research is focusing on. Um, also media portrayals of suicide. You guys have probably heard about 13 Reasons Why. Um, so that the media portrayals can have an impact um, on, um, on youth suicidal behavior. Uh, this so rural residents, this is something that I've done a little bit of research on. Um, people who live in rural areas have suicide rates that are twofold higher than people who live in urban areas for reasons that are still being investigated. Um, and then the last thing that I'll focus on a bit on here is access to lethal means. And this is really coming from sort of a, a public health perspective. So means restriction, um, what that term, what that means is that a highly lethal and commonly used method of of suicide is made less accessible or less lethal. In the US, most means restriction kind of advocacy has been around firearms, but in other countries, it has included things like reducing access to pesticides that are highly fatal and have been used in, in many suicides. Also making um, like certain medications, kind of changing the packaging or the dosage to reduce the, um, the possibility that they can be used um, to die by suicide. So. When means restriction is um, kind of uh, implemented, some people think, well, you know, a suicidal person will just use another method. And research has very conclusively shown that that is generally um, not true. And that even if they do use another method, that that other method tends to be much less lethal, right? So the substitute method is less, is less lethal, um, which means that the person is more likely sort of to get, you know, um, to not be seriously injured or to, to live in long enough to get medical care um, and psychological care. Um, and in the course of that, they can, the suicidal crisis, which is oftentimes short, it is short-lived, it is not necessarily something that goes on for a long time, that gives them time to get through the suicidal crisis, to get the help they need, and get on a path um, to recovery. So um, this, this access, reducing access to lethal means is a really key part um, of reducing the suicide rate. About half of all suicide deaths involve a firearm, um, and much research has shown that higher levels of firearm ownership, like in the state, the county level, um, are associated with higher teen um, firearm suicide rates. It's actually a stronger link than among adults. Um, on the sort of positive side, policies that mandate um, lock, gun safe locks and safe storage of firearms um, are associated with reduced teen suicide rates, right? So we have something that we can do about this, um, but more progress is needed. One in three homes with kids um, contain a firearm and in half those homes, the firearm is not locked up. Um, and many teenagers who live in homes with guns report that they have really easy access to them. So I want to take a moment just to share kind of the, the you know, I, I'm an epidemiologist, so I work with data and the data are their data points, but, but each point represents a youth who is in crisis. And I wanted to take a moment to share quotes um, from some of these youths. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I wanted to highlight a few. Um, so this, the first person here, these are teens um, interviewed as part of a research project. This teen says, like, everything piled up. It was just like, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. It seemed like anxiety and depression was never going to go away, and I couldn't do anything about it. The third, yeah, I was felt I was bullied. I felt really hated. It brought down my self esteem. Uh, then another teen says, uh, "My suicidal desire intensified, intensified after my classmate committed suicide. 
Uh, everyone was saying, how could he have done this to himself? Um, and I realized that made me feel even more alone because nobody understood how my classmate felt, which meant that nobody understood how I felt. Um, and um, I'll just say the last, the last quote here. So I didn't have the little things to live for. It was all falling apart, family life and school life. There wasn't any good. And I couldn't see the light at the end of the tunnel. I couldn't, when I thought about my future, there was just blackness. So just kind of, it's good to remind ourselves, right? That these, these are real people experiencing in, incredibly difficult circumstances for them. So internet use is something that people ask a lot about, you know, with respect to teens. So there is increasing amounts of research about, you know, how does internet use and social media use affect suicidal behavior? Basically, the sort of synopsis of this is that the, this is really mixed evidence. Um, so there, there does seem to be a potential that, you know, high internet use can you know, can result in harm. But the flip side is that many isolated young people actually find great communities, right? And the, the, if the online, and those online communities can be enormously helpful to them. So it's sort of like, it can be great for some youth and not so great for other youth. Same thing with social media use. For one thing, social media use and internet use are like, they're kind of hard to measure from a research perspective, but the, the researchers who have tried have found actually fairly weak relationships between um, social media and suicidal behavior. And it's possible that even those associations are potentially explained by other things. You know, the youths who are already suffering from mental health problems may be more likely to use social media in certain ways. And it, so it could be these kind of feedback loops and it's, it's hard to pick out what's the, what's the cause here. Um, so, and again, social media can be a positive influence um, for some teenagers. So I'll just wrap up here by, by talking a little bit about um, a, an area kind of, of, of research and suicidal behavior that I am particularly interested in. You know, a lot of the time we spend all of our kind of efforts focused on, we've got to prevent, you know, um, youth and other people from, you know, attempting suicide or engaging in suicidal behavior from, you know, from, in the first place. But I'm interested and many people are interested in like, well, what happens afterwards? Um, you know, after they've engaged in suicidal behavior, we need to be worried about that too. So the good news is that the vast majority of youths who engage in suicidal behavior do not go on to die by suicide. The vast majority of them. For some youth, it is a very impulsive act with few kind of long-term consequences. But the not so good news is that many youths who do engage in suicidal behavior do suffer from long-term psychiatric problems, health problems, family violence, sort of a, an array of social and legal problems. Um, and that is something that we need to be paying more attention to, to, to help them out and, and deal with these long-term consequences. Some of the work um, that I have done based here in California is using statewide emergency department data from California to track what happens to teenagers who do, you know, present to the emergency room um, because they have engaged in deliberate self-harm. Um, so in one study, we looked at about 6,000 youths who, you know, had shown up in basically in 2010. We tracked them for five years to see, you know, how often do they come back to the emergency room, what proportion of them die, and um, et cetera. And what we found is that 19% of them, so almost 20% of them, uh, made another self-harm emergency department visit um, within five years. 10% it was within one year. And the other thing we found is that they had very elevated rates of healthcare utilization and costs, right? So they sort of, it, they weren't just coming back to the ED in the hospital for self-harm, they were coming back for all kinds of things. Um, so they had these sort of trajectories of high intensity healthcare use, which, you know, you can only imagine is having ripple effects throughout their educational trajectories, their social trajectories, their social relationships, with their peers, et cetera. So um, this is another study kind of finding similar um, things where uh, adolescents found um, uh, in North Carolina, so they had high level, who had attempted suicide, they had high levels of anxiety, suicidality, financial and educational um, functioning, et cetera. 
So just to sum up here, um, we know that youth suicidal behavior is increasing. And unfortunately, we don't know why, but this is an active area of investigation. One thing to take away from my talk Suicide deaths are just the tip of the iceberg, right? There is this broader public health crisis of non-fatal suicidal behavior that is acutely distressing to youth and everyone who loves them. And we need to be focusing on that also. There are these key differences um, in overall incidence by, by age, by sociodemographic patterns. Um, and those can give us insight into who do we need to focus our intervention and prevention efforts on um, the, mo the most. So the rest of today's event is going to be focused on these evidence-based approaches to suicide prevention, right? So I know this has been a little bit of a bummer way to start the day, but the rest of this today is going to be like, there is hope, there are great proven strategies out there, um, and I really appreciate your time and attention and your efforts around suicide prevention. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Steger, for your presentation today. Um, I did want to just see if we could uh, engage in a couple questions. Um, Want to just take, take advantage of your time with us. And one question that came up in our, our chat is, if you could just talk a little bit more about how, how, how the pandemic has really affected youth suicide rates? If you have any data or information to share on that. Yeah, that's a great question. And you know, everyone, everyone in kind of suicide research work is wondering the same thing. Um, so in terms of actual data, the data are trickling in from sort of hospital system by hospital system. Um, death data are tend to be really slow to sort of get reported. So I don't think that we are going to conclusively know the answer to that for at least a year or two and possibly longer. And frankly, it's probably going to differ by state and by community, right? Some states have been harder hit. And so it's, it's going to look different in different places. Um, there is some evidence that emergency department uh, visits for self-harm have increased as a result of the pandemic. Um, I've seen a couple of reports about that. And again, from like specific places, um, sort of anecdotally, clinicians are reporting, um, you know, seeing many more patients, especially youth patients coming in with suicidal behavior. So there, there are certainly like good reasons to expect um, that there, that we may see an increase in youth suicidal behavior as a result of the pandemic. But I think it's a little too early to know. And, you know, one thing I do want to point out is that I, it's like many things where, the pandemic and it's the incredible stresses that it has caused for so many families, you know, could well have increased risk of suicide among uh, and suicidal behavior among the youths in those families. Some families have done okay and in fact, you know, may have seen benefits because, you know, youths whose parents were sort of at like traveling all the time or working all the time are now spending more time with their families. And so maybe for some of those youths, like it's actually improved things a little bit, but I think on, on balance, we're likely to see some increases in suicidal behavior, um, but the, the data are still out for by and large. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that information and for sharing some, um, you know, uh, light on the information, the question that we received. So um, again, thank you for your support and for your the information you presented today. It would be very helpful to help frame the day. And also, I hope that our participants were able to get a little bit more tools in their toolbox as to how to think about the, the way they approach their work and really care for the youth in our communities. So what I want to do now is um, just 